Having spent a considerable amount of time on geometric vectors, we will now speak relatively briefly about polynomials, or more generally, functions. Now, why do we not need to spend nearly as much time on polynomials as we did on geometric vectors? Well, that's because all of you already know perfectly well how to work with polynomials. You know how to add polynomials together to obtain another polynomial. You know how to multiply polynomials by numbers and do all other sorts of things with them, like graph them, which will come in handy in just a moment, take their derivatives, evaluate their integrals, or find their roots. So nothing here is new. What is new, or relatively new, is thinking of polynomials as vectors. And they're very clearly vectors in the sense of linear algebra, because you can add them together, multiply them by numbers, and it is abundantly clear that all of the essential required properties, including commutativity, associativity, and distributivity, are satisfied. So they're very easily seen to be vectors. Now, polynomials are very important. As I said before, they're particularly important in applied mathematics and physics, where finding a simple answer in terms of a simple expression to a complicated problem is still considered the highest art. It won't be for much longer, but it still is today. And also, if you think back to one of our motivating videos about Gaussian quadrature, understanding polynomials as vectors is key to figuring out Gaussian quadrature. In fact, when we talk about Gaussian quadrature, we'll talk about, this will be a very funny sounding expression, orthogonal polynomials. Now, of course, orthogonal comes from geometry. Polynomial comes from functions and we'll combine the two terms together. And that's an example of the world of geometry wielding its influence over all of linear algebra. All of the fundamental concepts of geometry will be brought over into the world of algebra and will inspire new and beautiful algebraic ideas. So that's why polynomials and functions are essential. One other application that I'd like to mention, in numerical analysis, where everything is done approximately. It will be very common to approximate a complicated function by a polynomial, because of course polynomials are some of the simplest functions there are. So applications in numerical analysis are massive. So in this video, I would like to mention uh, two things about polynomials. Here is one. When we talk about polynomials in general and consider all possible polynomials, they clearly form a vector space because the sum of any two polynomials is another polynomial. A polynomial times a number is another polynomial. But we'll want to limit our attention to only some of the polynomials. For example, we would want to limit our attention to quadratic polynomials. And if we look at just the quadratic polynomials, ignoring all polynomials of higher power, can they be treated as vectors? Is the sum of two quadratic polynomials, another quadratic polynomial, another object of the same kind, is a quadratic polynomial times a number, another quadratic polynomial, in other words, another polynomial of the same kind. <clears throat> well, eventually, the answer will be yes, but we have to be a little bit careful with our terminology. Because if you add these two quadratic polynomials together, you will notice that the quadratic term will drop out and you'll be left with minus 10x plus 6, which is a linear polynomial, not a quadratic polynomial. So if we want to restore this vector property, ability to be added together, also multiplied by numbers, if you multiply this last polynomial by 0, and remember, we should be able to multiply by any number whatsoever, including, very importantly, 0. If you multiply this last polynomial by zero, the answer will be the zero polynomial, which is technically not a quadratic polynomial. So if we want to restore the vector property, so we want the sum to also be a quadratic polynomial and product with a number to also be a quadratic polynomial, we just have to say polynomials of degree up to two, so that linear and constant polynomials are also included in the mix. So instead of cubic polynomials, we should really say polynomials of degree up to three. So you include cubic, quadratic, linear, and constant. Or in 
the utmost generality if we want to talk about polynomials of order n, we should say polynomials of order up to n. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, of course, when we talk about polynomials, I'll probably slip up or do it intentionally and just call them quadratic polynomials anyway, just because it's a more elegant expression than to say polynomials of degree up to 2. So just keep in mind when we say quadratic polynomials or cubic polynomials or nth degree polynomials, we really mean when we're talking about linear algebra, when we're talking about these polynomials in the context of linear algebra, we really mean polynomials of degree up to 2, polynomials of degree up to 3, or polynomials of degree up to n. All right, so that was point number one. Now let's talk about point number two. And point number two will be, like most points in linear algebra, inspired by geometry. So think back to geometric vectors and pick two geometric vectors in the plane. And then remember this very important point that we made, that once you choose two vectors in space and consider the plane that they're constrained to, then no matter what you do with these geometric vectors, in terms of multiplying them by numbers and adding them together, you will only be able to get other vectors in this plane. You will not be able to get any vector that is not within the plane of these polynomials. So you're stuck in this plane. Whatever plane the two geometric vectors are in, you're basically stuck in that plane and you cannot get out of the plane. Similarly, this is not adding anything new, just another example of the exact same thing. If you consider a single vector that lies along a particular straight line, you will never be able to get out of this line simply by multiplying this vector by some number, including negative numbers, that won't help, and adding to it other vectors along the same line. So you're stuck on the line. Now, can polynomials be stuck in a similar sense, although there is nothing geometric about polynomials? I just want to mention one more time that you could really not find two vector spaces that are any more different. Geometric vectors, drawings, polynomials, abstract symbols on a blackboard couldn't be any more different. Perhaps just about the only thing they have in common is their vector property, ability to be added together meaningfully and ability to be multiplied by numbers. Now, uh, can we find the analog of being stuck in some subspace for polynomials as we did with geometric vectors? And the answer is yes, we can. And even though there will be absolutely nothing geometric about this example, it is still inspired by geometry. And just like in the case of geometric vectors, we would call this plane a subspace of the entire space, we would use the same terminology applied to all other vector spaces, including polynomials. So I'm about to give you an example of polynomials stuck in a particular subset, and that subset will also be called a subspace. Terminology typically comes from the world of geometry. And here's my subspace. Well, polynomials are the sorts of things that can be graphed, so let's graph it. And I'm inviting you to consider all polynomials that pass through zero at x equals one. So at x equals one, our polynomials have a root have a root. So here's what these polynomials might look like. I missed it a little. Here's another. Oh, that's not even a polynomial. <laughs> now it is. Here's possibly one more. And consider all other polynomials. Now we're no longer limiting the power to quadratic or cubic. We're talking about all polynomials but we're only considering polynomials that pass through this point. Now, can these polynomials break out of this subset? Can you add two polynomials that satisfy this property? And there are some that does not satisfy this property. Or any polynomial that satisfies this property, but you multiply it by a number, and it no longer satisfies this property. And the answer will be, no, you're not able to do it. They're stuck in this subset. Just like our two vectors were stuck in the plane, or our one vector was stuck along a straight line. There are very many examples like this. Of course, there are infinitely many examples like this. 
you know, but this is just one and it's a pretty good one. And you will notice that the first two, uh, there we go, the first two of these polynomials satisfy that property. If you plug in x equals 1, then these polynomials will evaluate to 0. So x equals 1 is a root for each one of these polynomials. There's actually another synonymous way to describe that property. Having a root at x equals 1 is equivalent to the coefficients adding up to 0. So we could say one of three synonymous things. Coefficients add up to 0, x equals 1 is a root, or polynomial passes through this point. All of these things say the same thing. And what's nice about this example is its similarity with the geometry with the world of geometry. Right? Even though there's really nothing geometric about polynomials. Polynomials, they're studied in algebra, then in calculus. They're all, yes, we can graph them, but that's about the only visual thing that we can do with polynomials. There is really nothing geometric about polynomials. Yet there is, they have a property or they show they display a phenomenon that we can't help but associate with our geometric intuition with two vectors. This sort of thing will happen throughout linear algebra. I happen to believe that this is the most fundamental source of the power of linear algebra. We'll see this sort of thing happening over and over again. This is just our first example. All right, so this completes our discussion of polynomials, and in the next video we'll probably talk about Rn. Moving on, with our three fundamental examples of vector spaces, one uh, unlike any of the other two. Really, between these three examples, we couldn't find any other kinds of vectors that could be any more different. Drawings, abstract expressions, sets of numbers, all completely different, all vectors.